everyone. Um, just waiting for the slides to come up. Um, I'm here to talk about um, biomimicry. It's the field I'm from. It's the field of practicing um, learning from nature, not about nature, and emulating nature's genius. So my great joy is to spend my time exploring nature's technological miracles and translating those for um, applications in human design, um, particularly to solve design challenges. Um, you can see that wave is probably almost as big as the waves that he was he was surfing. <laughs> and I'm hoping you'll enjoy surfing this wave. It's a wave of inspiration. It's my inspiration. And it's a wave that's about the oceans of innovation that are coming out of the oceans and all the ecosystems on, on Earth. Um, if you can imagine how diverse life is, there's an extraordinary number of, of potential innovations. And it's been really hard for me to actually choose which ones to include. So I had to can some of them. Um, I didn't can the tuna, though, because there's way too many tuna being canned as we speak. So what can we learn from nature is what I'm really quite keen to, to, to focus on today. I really want to bring your, your field and your perspective about the ocean and have a whole different lens from looking at it. I'm not so much interested in who moved my sushi. I'm more interested it, at looking at the sushi and asking the question, how does my sushi move? If you look at the tail of a tuna fish, it's a very large crescent shape, and that actually combined with the mechanisms and motion of the tuna, has evolved through natural selection to be optimized. So much so that the energy of mo motion is 90% efficient in, in converting that energy into propulsion. So one guy said, isn't this interesting? What happens if we change that around? What happens if we could convert the energy of wave movement and actually convert it into energy to generation with that degree of efficiency? So Dr. Tim Finnegan from University of Sydney has invented what's known as the biostream. It actually um, converts tidal waves and tidal streams into electricity generation with a very, very high energy conversion efficiency. Now, if you think how much um, perpetual and consistent wave and tidal energy there is in the ocean, it's extraordinary to actually consider thinking how does nature actually use and tap that energy. In, in addition to this biostream, he's also invented something mimicking the sea fan. Now, the sea fan not only is able to pivot itself almost 300 um, degrees, but it can actually lie down if there's a huge storm. So to protect itself, it can turn into the current, making sure that it's always capturing the energy as well. He's also invented the bio-base system, which mimics the way kelp attaches to the floor of the ocean using lots of different routes instead of one heavy, um, bulky mooring that we typically use for our energy systems. So this could now tap up to 80,000 terawatts of <laughs> energy that are potentially could be captured from our oceans could now be captured in a way that actually fits in within the ocean, melding with the environment using oscillating systems, not pro a rotating system, so therefore causing less destruction to the environment. So if you think how, many, how much energy we managed to capture by looking at these small creatures, what if we looked at a humpback whale? Um, how does a humpback whale move? Now, this is one of my favorite, favorite examples. It was um, discovered by a b marine biologist called Dr. Frank Fish, and he's the only name I ever remember. <laughs> <laughs> he was fascinated by humpback whales and how they actually move. They, they're 15 meters long, but they can turn in circles so tight of up to one and a half meters. How do they do that? That's like a double-decker bus doing pirouettes underwater. Turns out they have these tubercles on the leading edge of their fin, which enables them to actually, instead of causing a lot of turbulence as the water goes over the edge, it goes into thin streams and allows it to actually grip the water at a much greater angle, something, uh, something like a 40 degree greater angle. He's converted that into applications for wind energy. Now these windmills can operate at low winds and turbulent winds, increasing their efficiency by up to 30%. It's now being converted to use in airplane wings. They believe that they can get a reduction in drag by 30% and an increase in lift of 8%. So we get excited with 1% drag reduction, that's extraordinary. Anything that has an, a leading edge, whether it's an uh, industrial fan or your computer fan, or even the fin of a surfboard, is now being improved by this amazing new understanding of hydrodynamics. So if you can just pause for a moment and think that you've just had an advanced hydrodynamics physics lesson from a humpback whale and from a tuna fish. <laughs> this is another question I think is worth answering. How do whale hearts pump 1,000 liters of blood every beat with less than 12 volts of electricity? Now, I'm not going to answer that question right now because it'll take you into a world of quantum physics that's really quite deep. But I am going to show you how the heart of a whale has been mimicked. There's a guy called Dr. Jorge Reynolds. Now, you can see there, it's a picture there of a, of a blue whale's heart, and that's the size of a human being next to the size of the heart. <laughs> this Dr. Jorge Reynolds was the original inventor of the pacemaker. Now, the pacemaker is um, extending the lives of millions of people 
It's a battery operated thing that's actually inserted deep into the heart. So if you can think about it, the original inventor of the pacemaker is now studying the whale's hearts to understand how they function. Whales have these amazing channels of cells that direct electric current in and around the heart. What is amazing is these cells are able to adjust their pathway to direct the current past damaged or to bypass damaged areas. He's now invented a nano technology system using carbon nanotubes that enables um, a pacemaker to be reinvented to be somewhere almost the size of a grain of rice, tiny, tiny, and it can be applied in order to actually direct the electric currents from, this from the healthy tissue to the damaged tissue without requiring any insertion at all, without requ requiring any battery-based pacemakers. What used to cost $100,000 in surgery now only costs $500 in the outpatient procedure. Think how many batteries are saved. Think how much energy is saved. And think of any other potential applications where we could potentially use this, this thinking. Now, this is the idea that I love to spread. <laughs> what if we looked at nature in a whole different way? What if we actually realized the things that nature has to teach us? How can sharks actually help save lives? Sharks have got amazing skin. And we learned a lot about the skin because people have used it in speedo swimming costumes. But the skin is actually extraordinary. It doesn't let anything stick to it. It's very rough. It's got this amazing surface. Now, bacteria don't like to stick to things that are rough because it takes too much energy. And bacteria become a problem in hospitals when they form biofilms, where they actually gather into large colonies. Now, many, many people are getting um, illnesses from hospital-acquired infections, and we try and treat the, um, the bacteria by killing them. This is a typical approach of people like myself, which uh, I was trained as a chemical engineer. Let's kill that bacteria, right? Nature over 3.8 billion years has figured out a better way. Let's not kill bacteria because they just uh, develop into superbugs. Let's just prevent them from forming colonies where they become a problem. So one company called Shark Technologies has actually mimicked the surface and created these amazing thin film surfaces that can be applied to hospital surfaces and um, um, incorporated into things like hospital catheters and even into products and surfaces of products that actually prevent the growth of biofilms as opposed to killing the bacteria. What if we realize that ocean creatures hold the solution to plastic pollution as well? Now, chemical engineers make plastics, we cause the problems <laughs> that end up there. As a chemical engineer, this is my major, major focus. How can we make plastics in a way that is biocompatible, that is biodegradable, that is life-friendly? The answer comes from this amazing material called chitin. Now, we use 300 different polymers to create all the different functions that we need in our human systems. Nature uses only five. One of them is, is, is chitin. Now, you might recognize chitin in the shells of this type of seafood. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same material, that very tough material that you have to to remove when you're eating the insides of the prawns. Now, there's a, there's a group of people at Harvard University at the Weiss Institute that have mimicked that chitin, um, combining it with another, uh, an, another set of proteins, rather like insect cuticle. They've developed an equivalent of plastic, low cost, lightweight, as strong and tough as an aluminum alloy, <laughs> and is totally biodegradable and biocompatible by mimicking the recipe of how nature makes those polymers. This is a materials revolution that I'm really excited to be part of. What if we realize that coral reefs, which are currently under a lot of threat from global warming and climate change, that they actually hold a solution for reducing carbon emissions? It's a company called Calera has taken the recipe for coral reefs, which takes carbon dioxide, bubbles it through salt water, and turns it into the equivalent of limestone. Because our current cement is ancient coral reefs that we have to heat up to very high temperatures in order to get them to a form that self-cements. We emit one ton of um, carbon dioxide for every one ton of cement made. This recipe sequesters half a ton of carbon dioxide for every ton of cement made. It's turning that carbon cycle on its head. What if we realized that we could poach ideas from abalone? <laughs> Another one of a material of revolution. These abalones make a material as strong and as lightweight as ceramics, or the equivalent of some aluminum applications, yet they make it from proteins and chalk. It's just this amazing combination of protein and chalk in this unbreakable um, material composite. There's multiple researchers investigating this and have figured out how to actually mi mimic this. The best thing about this, it's made at seawater temperature and pressure. So instead of that thousands of degrees of se Celsius to, uh, to make ceramics and a heck of a lot of energy to make aluminiums, this is low energy materials manufacture. This is the way nature makes materials. This is what I think is worth doing. And there's a wonderful TED talk by, by Angela Belcher talking about how much further they've taken that. So life's true genius for me is on how its technologies contribute to the continuation of not just one life, but all life on Earth. It's this amazing thought that life creates conditions conducive to life. How does it do that? 
I've given you tastes of the technologies that nature applies, things like extraordinary efficiency of form, combined with amazing processes that actually are using nothing but the locally available life-friendly materials and combining them at ambient temperature and pressure to cycle continuously in closed loops, loops using nothing more than the energy of the sun, the waves, etc. This is what I am very proud to say, is an approach to innovation that's innovation for conservation. Not only the conservation of energy and water, the conservation of ourselves and the conservation of all species. And it's really meaningful innovation because the companies that are now learning from nature to invent these amazing solutions are investing back into the ecosystems of the organisms, paying a percentage of their profits back to these ecosystems and organisms to say thank you for what they've learned from them. What I really have an amazing dream of doing is if imagine all the biologists out there, all the marine biologists, any naturalist, or even the rangers and, and, and anyone out in the field started to document what genius lies out in their place as they're exploring and as they're finding this information. And then we as the biomimics in the world can help to translate that and translate it according to whatever focus anyone's interested in. For my master's thesis, I looked at how does nature store energy. I went into all the research I could find on anyone who's found out how nature stores energy to see if we could find innovative ways to solving for life-friendly things, life-friendly batteries. And these are just some of the few that I found relating to the ocean. You can see we've converted that information, from just straight biology, to design principle, to design idea, and any existing biomimicry that exists out there. This is in a form readily available for any designer, whether you're an engineer, architect, business person. The people who design our world and influence how our world is going to be now have this information readily available for them. We're also using it now in the field of water. How does nature clean water? We've got a five-year project in South Africa looking at how nature does that. We're inventing a similar system for converting that information into a tool like this. These are just some of the organisms we found from the ocean that teach us amazing solutions for how does nature clean and desalinate water. My, my favorite things to do actually is bringing this information in real life to the people who design our world, teaching them the pra practical methodology, taking them into things like the aquarium, expanding the relevance of the aquarium so now it's not just a place for young kids to be educated, it's for big kids, kids like us who've forgotten <laughs> that we need to learn how to make things that work for life instead of against them. We take people out into the ocean, and tomorrow, just so you all know, there's this amazing opportunity for you to join us. So instead of sitting in a room <laughs> where you just hear about the ocean, come on the boat with us, it leaves at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it heads out for the whole day. We're going to be, have, we have uh, diving masters, we have marine biologists, we have uh, biomimicry specialists, and we have some of the speakers and the organizers of TEDx Seapoint on it. We're just going to go out for an adventure discovering the genius of nature. So if you look in your goodie bags, you'll see there's a pamphlet all about that if you want to come and join us. It's about taking people outside, out of their comfort zone. We get them to redesign, rethink, reimagine, and to act like kids again. <laughs> because smart people can be real, really stupid. I'm a chemical engineer, and a lot of chemical engineers think they're really smart, but they've caused most of the problems in the planet today. So getting ourselves to forget what we already know about nature, forget what you know about a shark, close your eyes and start to feel out new things, new discoveries. My favorite thing also in biomimicry is bringing kids into the world of biomimicry. Our Biomimic Kids program was launched at the Two Oceans Aquarium. And we're busy developing it into a bigger program to take around the country. Um, because these also are the future designers of our world. <laughs> if they start to view and value nature in this way from a very young age, imagine what they could be designing. We're looking for a world that works for life instead of against it. Now, ecosystems offer us practical models of how this is actually doable. Um, and biomimicry is a real practical methodology of how to actually achieve that. We must never, ever forget <laughs> that where we're heading. My final question I have is how does this sushi move? This is salmon, and it finds its way from the oceans of potential up, its, up against all odds, against this flowing current working against it, it moves its way upstream to find its way back home. How does it do that? It finds these little vortices, these eddies of energy, and it moves into those eddies. And because of the shape of the salmon, as it moves into the eddy, the vortex wraps around it and it pushes it up rather like squeezing a wet bar of soap. <laughs> so what I wanted to leave you with is this idea that although it seems like everything's working against us, if we tap these um, vortices or, or energy of inspiration that we've had from today, we can actually make our way up against this extraordinary <laughs> current that seems to be working against us and find our own way back home to recognize ourselves as a welcome species on our own planet. Because of course we are nature.
we are just a very young species among species. Um, and all of these great wise mentors that are out there to discover and um, explore are there to teach us how to fit in here. And the best thing about it is that we are just as potentially genius as all these species if we put our minds to it. The real legacy of biomimicry will be more than the products and processes that help us fit in here. It will be gratitude. And from this, an ardent desire to protect the genius that surrounds us. Thank you very much. Thank you.